Does anybody not know Romanian? What? Three, four, five? Uh, okay, so uh, my job is going to be just maybe a little harder tonight. It's fine. Uh, if my English is bad, I'll just blame it on the 10 years in Romania. Um, anyways, I, uh, it's good to be here tonight. God bless you guys. Um, uh, as uh, Pastor Moise said, uh, yeah, I've been here for a couple years now. I remember back in 2009, 8, we met back in Cleveland when I was doing my master's, Brother Moise. Uh, can I say this? We met out of all places in the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was a student there my first year. I'm doing my master's divinity in historical theology. And uh, at a break, I went to the bathroom. And uh, not knowing there's other Romanians around, Brother Moise was talking to Romania on the phone. He's like, what? <laughs> Romanians? <laughs> oh, man. So that's when we met for the first time, I think 2009, eight somewhere around there. And we've uh, you know, been friends ever since. And he's been a mentor for me. So I really appreciate his work. God bless him and the church here. I've been here doing my internship, I think 2010, 11, I was here for a couple months, uh, so a couple of you guys were just, maybe just a little younger, uh, maybe not even alive, who knows, <laughs> I'm just kidding, um, yeah, I'm doing some work in Romania uh, for the last 10 years, I'm not sure, you know, um, how long it's still going to be, but I'm trying to be faithful to God's calling in my life and uh, try and be, be fruitful where I am, and, uh, you know, that's very important to know, make sure you're in the right place, and, um, uh, another thing before I dive into the word, hopefully I, I don't sink into the word, <laughs> I can get out of it, because <laughs> there's some preacher, man, they can become boring after a while, and and uh, trust me, I heard, I've, ser I've heard over the years a lot of boring sermons, so I promise you, I'm not going to bore you to death tonight, if anybody gets bored, just raise your hand, I promise I'll stop, because uh, <laughs> I think that that's the worst sin a preacher can have, and, and you know, just bore his church out death, you know, so... Uh, just one quick thing about technology. Um, I know you guys live, and we live in a digital age, which is, uh, you know, phones have pretty much replaced most of our lives. Um, a lot of emails, a lot of businesses are done nowadays through, through our phones. And because of that, our, our brain has been um, somehow uh, altered. Uh, there's a great book out there. It's called um, Digital Dementia. It's an awesome book. I recommend this book. And I remember uh, the author saying that... Um, in our lifetimes, a typical person uh, checks his phone 81,000 times per year. Now, if you divide that by whatever, by minutes, it's like 3.4 minutes. Every 3.4 minutes, there's something happening in your brain. Something from your brain sends signals to your hands to pick up your phone from the pocket, from your purse, and to check your email. No, not email. You guys don't check that. Uh, your Instagram. <laughs> what are those guys have? Snapchat? Twitter, Facebook. Who, you guys use Facebook? No. That's the older generation. That's Frate Moises generation. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so, and this is so true. Uh, we become so tied down to this phone. And um, I just pray that you guys resist that temptation tonight. Amen? So, I know every 3.4 minutes, something in your brain is going gonna, is gonna to tell you, check your phone. Can you guys resist that tonight? How about we, we just open our phones and tell our, all our friends that are not here, man, you missed out tonight. It was amazing. And then just shut your phone. There we go. <laughs> there we go. And I promise you, you're not, you're not going to have any issues from there. Uh, but if you are tempted, it's fine. We'll just pray for you at the end. Uh, you guys yeah. can come up here. Uh, okay, so every 3.4 minutes. It's been like already 3.4 minutes, I think. Um, so you guys passed the first test. Anyways, um, if I'm... Uh, kind of running off tangents tonight. It's because blame it on my sleep. It's not just uh, David. I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning to, uh, to go to the airport in Lexington. So, yeah. Um, anyways, I'm kind of a little tired, just a little bit. Um, tonight, uh, I want to try something different. So if it works out, great. If it doesn't, just whatever. <laughs> um, I want to talk about end times Christianity. Now, there are two versions of that, and I know you're probably thinking, man, another end time sermon, prophetic things, you know, the rapture, the Lord's coming, the rumors, the wars, Afghanistan, the famine, probably the persecution, who knows, maybe the Antichrist. What is this guy going to talk about, right? That's the first thing you're talking about. So let's just let's spell out any, any doubts that you guys have or any issues, and I promise you I'm not going to go that route. 
I'm not going to talk about, you know, Nekazor Chilmare, the big persecution, the big trials and temptations. I'm not going to talk about who the Antichrist is. And it's not Hillary Clinton, I promise you that. <laughs> uh, although sometimes I, I think Joe Biden is pretty close. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I hope you're not filming that, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. Anyways, yeah. I mean, what, man, did you guys hear the last, like, speech the guy had? He couldn't, he was, like, sleeping, like, half of the time. I was like, dude, can you, like, fast forward two times, you know, like, on YouTube? <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I'm going to speak about tonight is on the two versions of end-time Christianity that I observe, that I see in our church, in our churches, in Romanian churches all across the board, all across the nation, all across Romania, America, whatever. And it's not just Romanian churches. I see it everywhere. So we will look at both of these versions, and um, I will let you be the judge of which one you want to be part of. Which side of the fence you want to be part of? Which crowd you want to hang out with? Which version you want to update your phone to? Let's just use that metaphor from now on. Um, let me just start off with a story, and you can help me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, put it back. That's not the story. <laughs> this is the story. Uh, Titanic. Um, confession time. How many of you have seen the movie? Hands up. Half, maybe. All right, half. Okay, it's 1997. How many of you were born in 1997? I'm just kidding. All right, so that's why. It's probably a little, um, it's a little old. So for those of you that uh, raised your hand, it's confession time. How many of you have seen, how many of you have seen the whole movie from start to finish? You know what I'm talking about, that wild interesting scene like in halfway where you kind of have to cross your eyes and you know put your hand and kind of fast forward you guys know what i'm talking about no all right it's good thank god you guys haven't seen it anyways maybe you need to confess if you did <laughs> um so where was i yes the movie the titanic it is officially in the top three category of all time money making movies in the world 2.2 billion dollars that's gross income now, that's not how much money they actually made. They probably made a couple hundred million uh, just because it's it's probably cost a couple hundred million to make it and it's, um, more than a billion is cost just to market it. Isn't that amazing? That's so much money they put into marketing. You wonder why people go and see these things. It's because they mess with your brain. <laughs> Anyways, um, so it, it is a huge thing. Titanic was and is probably like the most favorite you know movie for, for a lot of people to see even nowadays. And now, if you know the story if you don't i'll just go like very quick through it there was this huge ship you can go on to the next slide it was the largest uh, man-made ship object at the world in that time it was going to go from southampton uk england to the u.s crossing who knows what ocean come on history time here geography what ocean the atlantic thank you so much appreciate that you get a candy at the end uh, i'm just kidding uh, 2,201 passengers were on board. That's the huge ship. I mean, that's the biggest thing that we have in 1912, right? Now, this was supposed to be, if you heard the witnesses, the safest mankind ship that, that we've seen as human beings. But interestingly enough, in, in the middle of the night, suddenly, not expect, it just surprisingly, the ship was hit and an iceberg, actually the ship hit an iceberg and it started sinking. So you can go to the next slide. So five days later, right, April 10, five days later, as people were just enjoying their night, right, drinking coffee, maybe having some tea, maybe some wine, maybe just talking, maybe just listening to music because it was everything there. Boom, they suddenly hear this massive, massive right, accident that's happening. Now, it took a while for it to go down, roughly three and a half hours. So there was sufficient time for lifeboats to be placed in the ocean. I'm not sure exactly how many lifeboats were there because not all of them were used. Now, the strange thing about all this is that, and this has been studied and documented, by the way. I'm not just talking out of my brain here. Uh, this is, I'm not just making it up. This is something that historic historians talk about. The, the amazing thing is that these lifeboats that were lowered into the ocean throughout the first half right, the uh, first hour and a half, they were half full at best. Half full. Now, you can go on to the next slide, I think. 
So this is a, you know, caption. I'm not sure if it's the actual footage, probably not. But you can see that these, as these boats were lowered, they were not full at all. Um, every lifeboat had a capacity to save roughly 70 to 75 people. I mean, you know, like, as we say, right? Like, very close, very tight, right? Um, and it is clearly documented how many people entered each one of these boats, because when they reached, you know, the safe harbor, they had a list of everybody that was in the boat to make sure it was the same right person. So this is documented. In the first hour or so, most lifeboats had between 12, check this out, out of 70, 12 to 30 people. So minimum 12, maximum 30, 35, right? Half of these boats were full. So when the ship started being torn in half, these boats were floating into the ocean half or perhaps even one third full. And it's interesting that many of the people that were in the ocean, they were fighting for their lives. They're screaming, right? I mean, you just close your eyes, imagine what's happening there. 2,205 people, 1,500 died, all right? Only 700 something people survived. So you have 1,500 people screaming at the top of their lungs, help for help. There were, you know, and just frantic swimmers. And there's a, one account that says that, you know, people were just like killing each other because, you know, they're so desperate, you know, to find something to stay on, right? Because some of them had lifeboats, some of them did not have any lifeboats. Now, the waters was stone cold. It was roughly 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's below freezing point. So you wonder why in a couple minutes, most people went to hypothermia and then obviously died, um, especially if they're in the water. Right, so you made it if you're outside above the water, maybe on like a piece of wood or something. This is where some historians call the second disaster of the Titanic. So the first disaster is that they were not paying attention to what was happening. They thought they initially thought it was a small iceberg, but you know how, how icebergs are, right? You you see the tip of it, but you don't see the the base of it. It's just it's so big. So they 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 did not estimate things uh, enough. That was the first disaster. Now the second disaster. This is what the historians call the second disaster, and this is what it is. Although many of the boats were half empty, everybody started rowing away. This is just, man, mind-blowing. They started rowing away from the scene of the disaster. You can go on to the next slide. So as the ship, now this is from the actual movie, which is not actually true, but I, you get it, right? The image is there. So as people were going down, People were rowing away from the ship, from the disaster. Somehow they managed to dumb down the voices of those that were screaming, Help! I mean, you could hear it. It's not one person. It's 1,500 people that are screaming for their lives for somebody to come and help them, right? But interestingly enough, these people on their boats, maybe I'm just exaggerating a little bit for the effect, but it's there. They were happy and content with the fact that they had been saved. You get it? So a ship, of a boat of 70 people that was full of maybe 12 to 30 were roaming away happy and content that they made it. That they were saved. Only one boat, and you can go on to the next slide. This is again, true story. Only one boat ever returned to pick up survivors from the water. Lifeboat number 14 with officer Harold Lowe, who was in charge. One boat out of many boats. Now, when I read this account and I heard the story, the Spirit of God really got a hold of me and moved my heart. And since I was talking about end times Christianity, I want to get back to the subject. The Spirit of God talk, started talking to me about that. He's like, Adi, that's what a lot of people's version of Christianity is. Exactly as those people that were on the boats. This is the modern, the updated version of Christianity where people are just happy and content with the fact that they made it. They're on the boat. The fact that they're happy that they know Jesus. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven. And they just keep on rowing away further and further away from the disaster. And even though the boat has so many more seats available, even though it was half empty or half full, depends how you look at it, 
Even though they heard some of the so many people screaming, they rode away from the scene of the disaster, minding their own business, living life like nothing terrible was happening. And isn't that how many Christians, how many people are living today? Seriously. The brother was talking about, you know, the trials and temptations, and we do. I mean, it's going to just get worse. I'm not scaring anybody, but it's just bottom line. We know, we know how the book ends. Ends in a good way, but until that point, there's trials and temptations, there are persecutions, there, there are times that our faith is going to be trialed and, and, and tested. But somehow we manage to mind our own business. We manage to shun away the, the loud voices, the loud noises, because we are too busy. And this is what the Spirit was telling me. So I'm just jotting these things down as, I'm, as the God, God is speaking to me. Because we are too busy pursuing something other than God's kingdom. Matthew 6, chapter 33. Seek the kingdom first. So when you're not doing that, you're busy with something else. You're probably busy rowing your way from the scene of the disaster, happy and content, because you're too busy pursuing maybe a career, a hobby, maybe a relationship that we, you think or that we think might fulfill us ultimately. Maybe it's, it's a dream, perhaps the American dream. Now, what am I saying? Am I saying not to pursue your career? No, that's not what I'm saying. What am I saying? Am I saying not to pursue a relationship? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying to pursue a dream in your life. What I'm saying is that when you're too busy, with just that, you're missing out on the bigger picture. You're just like those, and put that picture back. You're just like those, the image, just like those, let's just call them Christians. Not the one, the, the other one prior to that. They're just happy and satisfied living a comfortable Christianity. And and so oftentimes, and, and, and again, the Spirit is speaking, and so I'm just jotting these things down, and God's, He's like, Adi, we settle oftentimes for a comfy Christianity. It's a Christianity that, that says, if it's not easy, I'm not going to get involved. Now, let me tell you something. Nothing in church is easy. I'm not kidding you. Even working with young kids is not easy. Even with babies, it's not easy. You think they're small, but they can keep you out the whole night. So what I'm saying is that, if you're looking for a comfortable Christianity, you're in the wrong place. Because there isn't anything called comfortable Christianity. If it's sacrificial, I'm not interested. And so many people, uh, people, Christians are living that comfy life that says, you know what? It's too much sacrifice. I'm not going to give. It's too much time. It's too much of my resources. God is asking too much of me. So I'm just going to be comfortable in my boat and row, row, row your boat gently down the... Not the stream, the ocean. And I feel like oftentimes, man, maybe, maybe we, are, we are living that type of Christianity, right? Am, am I just going off tangents here? Am I saying something that is maybe true of this generation? So, comfortable Christianity. We're settling for consumer-like Christianity, which is a Christianity that is based on feelings. How do I feel right now? It's not what does the Bible says right now. What is God speaking to me right now? How do I feel about this issue? And if I feel right, I'm going to do it. If I don't feel comfortable, I'm not going to do it. And I'm just thinking, I mean, these people that were on the boat, I mean, <laughs> they were scared. They were anxious. They felt abandoned. So th they said, man, I'm feeling bad. I'm not going back there because that's too much of a risk. Does that make sense? I'm not going to judge them for the fact that they did not go back. What I'm saying is that if we live our lives based on what we feel, then they have every right to keep on rowing away further and further from the disaster. So comfortable Christianity, consumer-like Christianity, business-like Christianity. So many Christians are asking the wrong question. They're asking, what's in it for me? What do I get out of serving a youth? What do I get out of coming to church Sundays? Why, what do I get out of the 10% maybe that I give to church? Does that make sense? That's what the first version, this, this is the version that you see so often. It's the majority version of Christianity nowadays. It's a comfortable Christianity. It's a consumer-based business 
mind, Christianity. When you weigh in the risks, you give in and you keep on rowing further and further away because it's too risky living a Christ-like Christianity. It is. Trust me. It is too risky. If you're, gonna, if you're not going to lay down your life and say, God, it's not about who I am. Isn't that the first thing of discipleship? I know you guys were big and are big on discipleship. Isn't that the first condition of a disciple? Whoever wants to follow me, not just be a Christian, but follow in my footsteps, he has to say it. Come on, just a little louder. Help me out tonight. I'm not here to preach to you guys. I'm just, he has to deny himself. That means your life is not your life anymore. That's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Here's Paul talking about the fact that he has died to himself. It's no longer about who he is. It's about who Christ is through him. And so when you live your life in a way that it's about you, it is too risky to live a Christ-like Christianity, which is, from my perspective, the only Christianity that you can live. But then again, we see a version of Christianity nowadays that is fluff, the sad part is, young sisters, brothers, friends, is that this version is the version most people update to. And it's not just you guys, by the way. I'm a pastor of a church of roughly 250 people. We're growing. And I can tell you that I see it in older people, younger people, married people, people with kids, people with no kids. It's a version that people want to update to. Because it's so comfy. This is the la latest version. It's the trendy version. It's got a lot of bugs from my perspective. A lot of errors. It's a mess. And, but although we see it, it's, just, it's one click away. That's how easy it is. It's a watered-down Christianity. It's a fluff. It's a superficial type of Christianity. It's, man, it's like one wind of trials and temptations and our Christianity is gone. I'm serious. It's all gone. The faith, the singing, the lights, the, the cameras, the action, everything's gone. That's how most, Christ, most people's Christianity is. It's so weak. It, it cannot stand the rain. It's not worthy of real devotion. And yet, it's just a click away. And you know what? Most people are tempted to download this version of Christianity. And most people do. So let's get back to the story, the real story of Titanic. On the Titanic, there was a man by the name of John Harper. You can go on to the next slide. This is John Harper. This guy was 39-year-old Scottish evangelist. Now, I know you're probably thinking, dude, this guy is not 39. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Based on how he looks, he's probably like 45. <laughs> All right, she's three years older than I am, man. I look a lot better than that. Anyways, <laughs> he was on his way. So he's a Scottish evangelist on his way to Chicago for a big evangelistic crusade. Now, keep in mind, this is the 20th century. A lot of crusades are happening. Evangelism is big in the 20th century, moody and so on. He was not alone, however. On the Titanic was the apple of his eye, his little daughter, Annie Jessie. This is Annie. Six years old. She's just one year younger than my daughter, Rebecca. And two years older than my youngest daughter, Anna. So this is Annie. Annie and her father are going together in Chicago, to Chicago, traveling to Chicago for this huge evangelistic event. Now, John was among the first who realized there was huge danger in this. He saw what was happening. He saw the ship hitting the iceberg. And so him and his daughter were the first ones, among the first ones, to kind of get out of their cabins. And we know that because in one of the first lifeboats that were lowered into the ocean, Annie, Jessie Harper, the six-year-old daughter, her name is there. It's written on the list. And you would think her father is right next to her. But surprise, surprise, John Harper is not there. His name is not on the list. The other survivors actually witnessed later on in life how John, her father, came close to the lifeboat with, with his daughter in his arms. And as, as he was hugging her, hugging her, as he was just looking at her in his eyes and just kissing her for the last time, he said, Honey, I love you. I will see you soon. And with that, he, he left with the ladies and the older woman in the boat. 
And he watched as the lifeboat was lowered in the ocean. Now, this 39-year-old man who looks like 50 listened to Jesus' words. He went back. And this is the amazing story. This is the other version that I want to talk about tonight. He went back to the boat to find the lost sheep. Not one, but more. So to save those that were lost, so he started pounding on the cabin doors, calling out women, children, and anyone that does not know Jesus, get to the lifeboats now. He was adamant. I mean, you're not, you can't joke around these things. You know, that boat is going down. So, and, and people are not paying attention to this message. So he started shouting louder and louder, women, children, and anyone that does not know Jesus, get to the lifeboats now. And he kept on pounding every single door. Now, he was a second-class citizen. Right? First class was on top. They were on the bottom. So as he's pounding on these doors, people are not listening, but he's louder and louder and louder because he has one goal in mind. He wants to save somebody. He thought, if I die tonight, and, and I think this is just the most amazing thing. He's like, listen, if I die tonight, I know where I'm going. I know Jesus. I'll just get there sooner than I thought. That's it. But if they die, not knowing Jesus, they will be spending their whole eternal life in hell. Man, and, that's, and that thought itself pushed this man to go back to every single door and pound on it. Now, all around him, lifeboats were being lowered, so he could have easily justify his desire to be with his daughter. And listen, and listen, I, I want to be frank. I don't think... Nobody would have judged him because of that, right? Because it was his daughter and somebody had to take care of her. So he was the only guardian there. So, I mean, he had all the rights to be in the lifeboat with his daughter. And nobody would have judged him for that. As a matter of fact, we would have said, this man is a hero. He saved his daughter, right? He would have probably been, you know, been put somewhere in a, in a hero um, plaque somewhere. But he didn't. He kept on calling people to get to safety. Now, John Harper ended up being one of the hundreds in the water that night, thousands, a thousand, some 500. And realizing that the lifeboats were sort of roaming away, 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 he started changing his message, his battle cry. He started being blunt about this. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus as he's in the water. This is, this is a true account. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. So he started saying it louder and louder because a lot of noises were around. He wanted to make sure that his message got across. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. You know who else said that? It's in the Bible. Anyways, numerous testimonies speak of this fact. Beyond all the cries of anguish, there was this male, peculiar, unique voice calling out, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And only God knows how many people were saved that night. Perhaps giving their life to Jesus. Now about, about one year later, a lot of survivors from the uh, Titanic kind of reunited and had their first sort of ceremony of what happened on that night. And on the stage, the first person to come up, you can go on the next slide. The first person to come up was this man, a young man by the name of William John Mellers. And I just want to read his testimony. This is a fact check too. I was only 19 years old when I boarded the ship. I was one of the many hundreds who ended up in the water that night and I still remember holding on to a piece of wood trying to make it and realizing, man, there's no chance. Towards the end of his speech, he shared the following. The current brought him closer to a man he later identified as John, that 39-year-old evangelist. John Harper looked at the young man and shouted, Sir, do you know Jesus? William was not prepared for that question, so he just was silent. John continued, Believe in the Lord Jesus with the same message, and you shall be saved. William was not prepared for that question either, so he kept on being silent. And now the current brought them apart for some time. And a couple of minutes later, the current brought them back together. And there was this odd voice again. Sir, do you know Jesus now? <laughs> this time the 19-year-old responded with a tremid voice. No, sir. I cannot honestly say that I do. 
John called them one more time, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved tonight. And that was the last, song, the last time William John Miller saw the evangelist. The most beautiful part about this is that that night, William John Mellers actually gave his life to Jesus. And by a miracle, hours later, six hours later, he should have been dead by now. By a miracle, he was picked up, go on to the next slide, by the only returning lifeboat. Lifeboat number 14. Those men that said, man, we got to go back. I'm not just happy and content by being saved all alone. I want to get as many people as I can on this boat with us. A year later, at the survivors' reunion, he shared his testimony. He ended the testimony by saying, I was saved twice that night, physically and spiritually. So these are the two versions of end-time Christianity. You can go to the next slide. This image is very, let's just say, it speaks more words than I can say. It's there are two currents. It starts together, and at one point they kind of drift towards different ways. They part ways. And my question tonight for you is: What version of Christianity are you living? The first version is where you get on your boat that is maybe half full and just kind of rowing away happy and content that you're safe, that you're singing your songs of deliverance, that you know your, your kids are safe, that you're safe, you're kind of playing the safe, you're not risking anything for Jesus, for the safe, for the lost. You know, you're kind of rowing your way thinking, man, it's just, it's too risky to go back. I, you know, I got a business I got to take care of. Man, I, I got a family I got to feed. I got a family I got to, my kids have to go to, you know, Harvard, you know, and they, they got to, you know, they got to get the best education. No, my kids have to have, you know, a good job. And so I'm going to work hard for that. I don't have time to go back and save anybody. Remember, out of the many lifeboats, one, one came back. So if we did just a small calculation mathematics here, who's a math guru here? 700 some people, right? If maximum 70 people could have fit in, in those boats, that would have been 10 boats, 10 boats. But since there are between 12 to 30 people in a boat, right? There are a lot more boats. Let's just say more, double, triple, four times more, 40 boats that were rowing away from the disaster. Only one boat out of 40, just the number, let's play with it, came back. And that is the John Harper version of Christianity. And that is Paul's version of Christianity. Where he says, man, I am willing to risk it all for the sake of the gospel. I am willing to go into all this world and forsake it all for the price of knowing Jesus and having people know Jesus. Knowing that if we can just save one more soul, all of heaven rejoices. Here's the conclusion. What version are you going to buy? What version are you going to update to? There are two versions. Is the comfortable one? Is the easier one? It's just one click away. Or is the risky one that says, you know what? I'm willing to risk my life to go back. And even if I have to, I have to die, it's okay. I know where I'm going. Now, if you don't know where you're going, man, tonight I hope you're going to and, and I really want to pray, by the way. I'm, I'm kind of taking maybe too much time. But, man, I want to pray about that. I mean, if you're not sure where you're going, man, I, I pray tonight is one of those nights that God encounters you and says, you know what, don't leave here without knowing where you're going. But, but if you do know where you're going, I hope you're going to be one of uh, John Harper says, you know what, I'm no, I know where I'm going. I'll probably get there sooner than I thought, which is okay. Because God is the one that takes care of my family, my kids. And by the way, his, his daughter became a, an amazing person. She's an American that lived a, a wonderful life. So God takes care of that. I know where I'm going. I'll just get there sooner. But I have to save as many people as I can. Um, if you guys want to stand up, I, I, want, I want us to pray tonight. I mean, frankly, I just don't want us to be like another message. I've heard, I know you guys heard a million times messages and you know, tonight it was not a message. It was more of something that I felt God speaking to my heart regarding these end-time Christianity 
days we're living. That it's not about the Antichrist. I'm not waiting for the Antichrist to come. I'm not looking for the chip or the vaccine. I'm not getting into these, these, these baits because they're worthless. They're pointless for me. They're meaningless. What is my passion within all of that what was going on is, can I just save one, one more person? Can I just go back and, and find perhaps there's somebody, if you saw the movie Titanic, right? Remember, you know, she finally, you know, whistled and, and they finally found, perhaps there's somebody there that I can, I can find that is still alive and I can bring to Jesus. That is the Christianity that I want to live. What is your type of Christianity? What type of Christianity do you want to live? And I pray tonight, you know, God will definitely speak to your heart regarding that. If you need prayer, we are here to pray for you, man. We are here. David is here. The pastor is here. I'm here. We are, I mean, Danny is here. Everybody's here to kind of come here and say, man, I, I need Jesus right now. I, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going. Or perhaps if you're here tonight to say, man, I live the comfortable Christianity. I live the Christianity that was all about me about, you know, the business mind Christian. What is it in it for me? Or if you're here, you know, you probably live the consumeristic Christianity where it's like, what am I getting out of this? You know, what is it in, in it for me? And how do I feel about it? Then I pray for you too tonight, that God will speak to your heart. You get away from the comfortable Christianity, from the consumer mind Christian, from the business type Christianity, and you come back to real gospel, which is denying your life and giving your life to Jesus. So wherever he takes you, However he takes you, whatever it takes, you do whatever he tells you. Amen. Let's just pray tonight. If you need a prayer, just raise your hand. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.